Around mid-January 1996, a big convoy of trucks arrived near Stubal in Portugal, where I live. They were about 200 trucks and they occupied uh, an old ceramic factory called Sado Internacional and they clean up the area and start living there the next Saturday they um, put fires everywhere in town and created a big rave party we weren't used to anything like that it was amazing to see all these artists, musicians, pulling together incredible event. Uh, they were very creative, they used some of the bricks and materials from the factory to create the decor. And at some point in the party there was this huge alien launching balls of fire into the city and the fire traveled to some strategic points and there were like explosions um, they had like straw and there was some rain and the straw and the rain made something completely magical we were all fascinated uh, a week later we did another party and this time I got involved with them helping with the logistics, with the authorities uh, making like a liaison, going to the radio, being interviewed on the radio station and explaining what they were doing. Um, basically this was the beginning of the rave movement in Portugal. There were four sound systems, Spiral Tribe, Kamikaze, Fakem and Total Resistance. After that, they clean up the space and left, and they went towards Caparica, uh, where it's like a near a beach. They also find a, an area, and they created another rave party. And they stay there for a while, and uh, I traveled there and had an amazing time. At the time, I was the only person that I could see with a a video camera, camcorder, and a camera, photographic camera. And I took hundreds of photographs and I have hours of footage. I was completely fascinated with that nomade style bringing parties to small places. And it, it was a lot of fun. They had been kicked out of England because the rave scene became too big and the authorities were like squashing them and they squashed them out of, um, of England. And so I became friends with some of the members and they used my house as a in town, a place where they would come to do laundry, uh, take showers, all the logistics that traveling people um, need. And uh, I end up having like a romantic affair with one of them. And um, a few months later, he invited me to travel with him. So I, I had the experience. Um, of living that life uh, 
uh, first we went to north of Portugal to Coimbra where a group was staying there um, and from there we moved we moved through Spain uh, France uh, there was a a big festival in Normandy where we stayed um, for that festival and from there we traveled to Amsterdam it was a, an incredible explosion of art that we could participate and music it, it was just the rave scene was actually booming, was coming to Portugal and it was breaking lots of new taboos, barriers and the young people start coming and it was very interesting to watch it grow and see how people's minds were changing and the way people start accepting people that were different because all these artists they had tattoos and piercings dreadlocks they were dressed differently and I think they people start getting used to it even though we're talking about Portugal in the 90s it was still very d different made me a richer person uh, maybe more of a free spirit, the whole experience opened my horizons. I became anxious to experience that freedom of going somewhere and start something and be part of something that is bigger than us. A few years later, I ended up moving to England and being part of the festival scene. In Portugal in 1997, I also uh, became fascinated by the Boom Festival. A different type of music was go trance music instead of techno. But the spirit, th there were some similarities with the lifestyle and the way of living no, a different kind of life, out of the box, out of the norm. So I, I lived in England, going to the UK summer festivals. Uh, I had a little kid at the time, and he, he would run free in Glastonbury Festival, festival with thousands of people. And, uh, I got involved with the community from Gla Glastonbury and I, I have really good fun memories of that life, that experience. I'm very grateful for the opportunity of filming and photographing that movement and I've always respected their privacy. I never, I never took advantage of my images to make any kind of money. I respected people, people's privacy, and only recently I've been contacted to share my footage, to share my images. Because looking back, I was recording history. <laughs> And I, I have all these images that I want to share. I'm open to share more of these images for other people that would contact me. As long as it's not for profit. And I hope this can give people some of the spirit uh, of those times where there was no phones. <laughs> that would record images and taking photographs was actually quite expensive. I used to save all my money to buy 
film and have those photographs to be developed or some of them I develop myself to the black and white ones. It's very precious, it's a very precious time. I love that people are actually contacting me. And um, I'm very open for lots of artistic projects. Whoever wants to use my images, it's my legacy.